I'd like to show you why knowing your why is the start of your journey. Without a strong why, it can be so difficult to reach your maximum potential. My name is Dr. Jason Ballara, and every week I meet with real estate investors and mindset specialists that are taking action in order to build a life according to their own terms. We will break down what drives successful people and allows them to achieve at such a high level. If you are a professional wanting to break through, or simply someone that wants to hear an inspiring story, the Know Your Why podcast is made for you. Hi everyone, I'm Jason Ballara and this is the Know Your Why podcast. Today I'm here with Matt Burke. Matt is the founder and CEO of Fairway America and Very Vest. Um, he's a seasoned real estate entrepreneur, a fund manager, and advisor to hundreds of other real estate managers in the United States. Um, to be honest, I, I don't think your bio does you justice given all the, all of your experience in the industry. So um, first of all, Matt, thanks for coming on the show. I really do appreciate you taking the time out. Yeah, it's my pleasure, Jason. Thanks for having me. Yeah, absolutely. Would you go ahead and kind of, you know, tell us your story, let the listeners know more about you? Uh, really kind of impressive if you look at the numbers, but but really, I think just giving us your story and, and then we'll dive in from there. Yeah, I'll try to give you a high level uh, overview that gives you a flavor of kind of some of the things that I've done. But I, um, I've been in the real estate finance business really my whole career. Uh, um, started when I was in my 20s with a California-based thrift doing hard money loans. That company opened an office out of state in Portland. I moved up sight unseen to Portland, Oregon from California to run it. And a year later, they got caught up in the SNL crisis and they uh, closed up shop. So at, at age 27, I had to figure out what I wanted to do. And I just hung out my own shingle, right? And started uh, brokering loans. And that was really how I started in business. That was a little over 30 years ago. And since that time, you know, we've been a mortgage broker. I've been a fund manager, been a private lender, raised a lot of money from private investors, serviced those loans, done it in the form of individual deals, both fractionalized loans and syndicated, you know, one-off ownership of property or loans against real property. And we've started and managed, I think we're on our 11th uh, private fund at this point. Um, coming out of the Great Recession, I'd say the hardest part of my career, and you know, of course, in 30 years, I've been through a number of uh, ups and downs in the recession, recessionary periods, right? But the Great Recession was the big one. And I'd say a lot of lessons learned coming out of that. Uh, it, at that time, I had a number of uh, real estate people who knew that I had managed funds and were asking me advice about, you know, hey, they were thinking about setting up a fund. And Matt, I know you've done some funds. What do you think of this? And what do you think of that? And what should this be and what should this look like? And so we started uh, doing some advisory work for those people and helping them set up their own fund. And mostly, you know, people have to go to a lawyer to do that, right? A securities attorney, and they and they definitely should because you want to make sure you're compliant with law. But lawyers, in my experience, come at it from a legal angle, you know, and a fund manager has to come at it from eight or 10 different angles, right? You have to know how to originate. You have to know how to manage the assets. You have to know how to raise capital. You have to do investor relations. You have to know the accounting. You have to know the legal, right? There's a lot of different moving parts and setting all those things up properly so that they function well is incredibly difficult to do. So in 2011, 12, we started doing that kind of work. And since that point, we've played the lead role in advising and guiding uh, managers and allocators in setting up their own investment funds and syndications probably on our above 400 at this point. And it's pretty much any type of real estate secured thing that you can think of from, you know, buying uh, commercial property to fix and flip, to making loans, to distressed debt, to tax lien certificates, you, you know, you name it. We've set up the fund. We we formed uh, Veravest as in a fund administration company that does all the back office accounting work and set up an advisory and entity set up and so forth for those groups. So uh, I'd say my Brett, my experience in the real estate private investment space over the last 30 years has been pretty broad and extensive across a lot of different asset types, uh, both debt and equity, and both pooled funds, syndications, and running our own funds. So um, I've got a pretty good preview, I think, of you know how that market works, what the challenges are, some of the ups and downs, and and uh, you know it's been quite a ride, Jason. And I, I can't say I had it all planned out that way in the beginning, but you know things work out kind of how they do. And um, you know at this point, 
as my as my securities lawyer said is like Matt, you've you've got your PhD in real estate fund management, so I feel like you know I've got a pretty good grasp on it. Yeah, yeah, I I would say so. I, th <laughs> I think that's probably probably a, a major understatement. I um, it, it's interesting. We we talked a little bit about this before you know we started recording, but but you have I I, I believe a, a unique perspective in the space. One both just strictly from a fund management standpoint, I think there's, you know, a lot of people are syndicating, but, but it sort of seems like starting your fund is almost like the hot topic right now. A lot of, a lot of syndicators are going to the fund model, but mm -hmm. you have just, that's what you've been doing for, you know, a long time now. So that, <clears throat> to then fill that space, that need for people to have, you know, kind of assistance with, with managing those funds, I think was, is a, is a great service to provide to others. Um, but also, I mean, I think it's going to uniquely position you to, to know even more than you already knew. Cause now, now you're not only having your own experiences, but, you know, sort of integrating all of every, all of the other fund managers experiences with their, with their support. Do you, do you feel like that has, or did you already sort of know it all? And now, well, now you can, well, no, I, we, no we learned, we learned a ton, man, from, you know, 2012 to 22. I mean, I, of course, had my own experiences setting up a fund and winding down a fund and what it's like, you know, when it's good and what it's like when you're dealing with a recession, you know, what it's like to have credit facilities, what happens when they don't get renewed, you know, what happens when investors want redemptions, you know, what if you're in an open-ended fund, a closed-ended fund, right? We've done all of those things. I would say that you know, a, a definitions are important in my mind, Jason. So let's say a syndication to me yeah. means that's one asset, right? One property with multiple investors, right? And it could be two investors or 10 or 20 or whatever, but it's it's only a single asset. So that's actually relatively straightforward because you only have one property, right? That feeds into the income and expenses that feeds into it. And then you have to distribute to those investors. A fund a pooled investment fund means you have multiple assets and multiple investors, right? Coming in at various points in time. So you acquire one property today and another one a month from now and another one three months from now, right? And then you've got investors coming in at different points in time. It's an order of magnitude more complicated from a, a structuring standpoint, from a capital raising standpoint, from a capital call standpoint, from an accounting standpoint. It's just much more difficult to do a pooled investment fund than it is a syndication. And I, my experience is that a lot of syndicators or their equivalent in the lending space, which would be fractional private lenders, right? They're raising money to fund a loan, you know, one loan at a time from multiple investors into a pooled investment fund. People just don't know what they don't know. So it's a bit like, you know, some of your audience can appreciate this, I'm sure. And you may or may not, we don't know each other, but um, it's like having kids, right? You can, you can babysit your, your brother's, you know, children and get a taste of what it's like for a night. But like, until you actually have a child and you have to raise them and deal with all the issues. And then there's different problems at different points in time in the lifespan, right? I mean, an infant's different than a toddler, which is different than a, you know, 10 year old, which is different than a teenager, and you just, you can't possibly know that entire journey until you've been on it, right? And that's what it's like to do a fund. So I, I would say people will try to come in from a syndication to a fund and they have myths and perceptions about what it's going to be like, but they don't fully appreciate the depth of the issues, you know, until they get into it. And I'd say that's the biggest value prop that we bring to the table for them is we help them identify what those issues are going to be. And they're remarkably similar across all managers in the space and it doesn't really matter if you're doing office or warehouse or you know multifamily or you know distressed debt it's the the problems and the issues and the challenges that they face are very similar from one to the other so yeah. you know that's really what we've spent a lot of time doing the last 10 years is helping people set it up properly in the first place anticipate mitigate those issues before they even happen you know, in ways that they don't even fully appreciate until they get into it two and three and four and five years down the road. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think the, the having children analogy is perfect and it, it's, uh, it's true. It's, you know, it's easy to be the uncle, right? It's easy to go and <laughs> kind of hang out with them for a little while and then give them back to mom and dad, mom and dad. But my wife and I joke, like kids never leave. They're always, 
<laughs> that's right. Well, it's kind of like, uh, I get at this point, Jason, I feel like I'm the grandparent, right? Because it's like, I get a little bit of the best of both worlds. It's kind of fun, you know, to have the kids around, but like at the end of the night, I get to hand them back to the fund manager and right. You know, right. think about something else. Right? Yeah, exactly. Exactly. So, I mean, we've talked a lot about on this show about syndication and syndicating the one-off uh, properties. I've mm -hmm. talked to a few people that have, you know, sort of dabbled into funds, but I, but I, most of them, honestly, you know, there's like new to the fund world. And, um, but you mentioned definitions and I think it's important. Some of the things you brought up about these types of funds and, you know, what, are there a few high level things that you could define for our listeners as far as, you know, when we say fund, what are the options, right? Like if they want to invest in a fund, what types are there for them? Um, I guess we could start there. Well, there are, there are all types. I mean, I, and mostly I'm talking about, uh, these are 506 regulation D funds, and that's just kind of a technical term, but it, it, it means that they're exempt from registration with the SEC as an investment company, right? So these are not, not these are private uh, funds run by individual managers, right, that are not required to become a in registered investment advisor typically and do not register the fund with the SEC as an investment company, right? Now, there are other types. There's Reg A plus, and these have been relatively new, you know, Reg A and Reg A plus that have come out in the last 10 years. But um, I'd say those are far less common. I mean, almost all of them are Reg D funds. Yeah. Right. And then beyond that, then you're looking at, OK, you could I mean, there, there's multifamily, there's retail, there's office. I mean, there's as many varieties as you can you you can think of or across the country. And there's in in the sub institutional space, which is where I'd say I've always played and, and try to stay. These are not, you know, the size like a Blackstone or Carlisle or, you know, one of these big managers. These are small, usually starting at zero or very little. You know, it, it to a few million up to maybe fifty or a hundred million, right? Which, which by institutional standards is very, very small, and and all types of assets could be debt, they could be equity, could be open ended, could be closed ended, um, and it could be any number of different asset types. And I think all of those are available to investors if they really know where to look. You can find all manner of choices to you know to pick and choose from to invest in. Now, then you start looking at, all right, how do you choose one from the other? Because they all kind of look the same. You know, what kind of a due diligence process do you go through? Because, of course, in a fund format, the investor is not picking the assets, right? In a syndication, the investor knows, okay, I've got that property, right, at 123 Main Street, and here's its characteristics, and I can say yes or no, and the money's going to that deal. In a fund, they're saying, I'm giving the manager my money, and then the manager is picking and choosing deals that I don't get any say in whether, you know, that that manager decides to do that deal or not. So it's often called a uh, blind pool. You'll hear that term, right? Meaning that the investor is blind to which specific assets the manager is choosing inside of whatever their investment mandate or strategy is that they articulate in their offering documents, if that makes sense. Yeah, no, it does. And, and I think the that point about you know essentially if you're you're investing in a syndication I, you you're always investing with in the operator but or the manager yes. however you want to call it but but in reality with especially with a fund that's all you're investing in right because you don't know right. what which property there, there's going right. to be so in in that right. one off syndication model okay you at least might be able to say like oh I don't like this one because it's you know in the wrong city or whatever you know whatever the case that's may right. be um yeah, and I agree with you that even in a syndication, the investors are investing heavily in the manager, the operator, the person who's you know running the deal. But in a fund, that's 10x true. Right. That's that's all you have to go on, right? You, I'm sure that you know you're you invest in a fund, you you are gonna get reporting on what deals are are purchased within that fund and and you know kind of where your um return yeah, metrics are coming if from. The manager is capable of of generating those reports, which is also all over the map. Right. Because there's no legal requirement for them to do so. You know, there has become more and more of an expectation on the part of investors that managers will do that. And, you know, I think that's a good thing. Right. Sure. Because it's forcing managers to up their game. But there's no legal requirement. And up until five or 10 years ago, when a lot of these uh, investor portals and software started coming out, I mean, 
oftentimes, Jason, the only time you'd ever hear from your manager is once a year when you get a K-1, <clears throat> right? Or a 1099, depending on what type of you're invested in. So, you know, it, it is really still in a lot of ways, the wild, wild west, right? In the small balance, non-institutional space in terms of, you know, just inconsistency of reporting, uh, you know, highly variable quality of managers um, and assets and so forth. And I, I think from an from a typical passive investor standpoint, who might be, you know, like in your world, uh, you know, uh, medical professionals that are trying to, you know, invest in passive income, there's a lot of choices. Yeah. But it's hard for them because they have jobs, right? And they have they have expertise that isn't necessarily real estate. How do they pick one from the other? You know, yeah. it's it's very, very difficult. Yeah. So I think that as a well, I, I want to get your opinion on this. I've, I've I've had this sort of question in my within myself is both from the investor as the passive investor or as the operator, why might you choose a fund? Right. And I think there's some there's some probably obvious answers to that, like yep. diversification within a fund as yep. the investor. But but I feel like there's got to be more to it than just that, because there's there's certainly, uh, as you mentioned, I mean, it, you're, you're 10xing your trust in the operator and, and all of that. Yeah, I, t I tell people all the time, man, that whether it's an investor or a manager that look, funds and syndications are not inherently good or bad unto themselves right it's they have their each of them have their pluses and minuses from both the perspective of the manager and the investor and it, it's very situational i think as to whether somebody chooses one versus the other so you know if i was to make a list of pros and cons of each one you know i, I could do that and have done that many many times but i'd say on the fun side diversification is a good one uh, it's it generally is much more passive than than the other uh, type of investment, especially if you're investing in something that pays back very quickly because you get the money back, then you have to sit on it, then you got to pick another one, right? You, you're picking and yeah. choosing more frequently. If you have a good fund manager, you, you can pick and choose amongst, am I looking for income? Am I looking for capital gains, right? Do I want to reinvest the dividends so that I can just continue to get, allow my capital you know, to grow inside that? vehicle. And if I'm comfortable with it, I might be able to invest in an open-ended fund that lasts for five or 10 years and never really have to worry about reinvesting my money if I'm content with my manager and with what I'm getting. So, uh, but that said, other people, you have to pay attention to what you're investing in. Some of them have redemption mechanisms that afford the, the investor the ability to get out of that fund at some point in time and others don't. Uh, so, you know, you just have to understand in my mind, the step one for the investor is what are my priorities, right? What are my objectives? What am I trying to achieve? And then once I narrow that down, then I can say, all right, does a fund or a syndication better suit my, my particular needs? Sure. Right. And from the operator perspective, again, I think there's, you know, from someone who doesn't have a fund, <laughs> the, mm -hmm. the sort of most appealing thing about that is that the money's already there, right? So yeah. you don't have to, you find a, a great deal you want to get, you don't have to scramble to, you know, kind of raise that capital. But but again, as you mentioned, I'm, I'm, there's a lot more administration that goes into it. So there, there's, there's pros and cons there as well. Yeah. And I would say I have, what you just said, I've probably heard that a thousand times from managers and, uh, you know, thinking about moving from the syndication of the fund. And what I would tell you is that it's much more difficult to raise money in a fund than it is in a syndication because precisely because investors don't know what you're going to be investing in. Right. And they can't pick and choose and so forth. And so the money, the money is only there if you actually have commitments from investor to give you that money, or you've actually taken their money into the bank account. So you still have to go out before you tie up a property or whatever and get those commitments in order to be able to have the confidence that the money is there. Um, so it's it's a theoretical thing that's that's a great example of how like, you know, maybe the way people think having kids is is one way and the way it actually is is a different way. Yeah. Yeah, I mean and I think, you know, like I said, for me it, as a, as a, someone on the outside looking in and when you're raising capital for a single deal and you you're getting crunch time and some you know, I know people Fresh, that are experienced exactly. it's 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 maybe easy for them, but it, it's not easy for everybody. 
And so you see the fund as, oh, that's a way to sort of beat that hurdle. But in that's reality, right. it, it doesn't change whether or not you have to raise capital. It's just you've got to you sort of do that all the time so that your fund has the money in it to go get deals. Yeah. An advantage to a fund is that you're selling the same thing again and again and again. So you you don't have to prepare different you know, offering memorandums and pitches and you know financial models and so forth for each time you want to go out and do a raise. Right. So in, in that way, it can be easier once it's all set up. Right. But the the counter argument to that is the investor doesn't know which in which investment you're making. You're asking them to trust you. And especially for a first time fund manager, that can be a pretty high bar. Right. It's it's difficult mm -hmm. to get people over that trust factor. I'd say most managers will tend to start with people they know right? Friends and family and tight acquaintances and so forth and work out that your circle of influence and you work out from there to a broader audience of people who know you less. And the longer you go and the more track record you have, the easier it becomes, right? To get people you don't know to trust you because you have some credibility that you can convey to them. But that takes that takes time. Yeah. Yeah, for so sure. I, I don't. I, mean, I would tell guy. I tell people all the time. Jason is like, you know, I, I the first thing I would do when someone asks me about helping them set up a fund is ask a bunch of questions. And you know, I think it depends how much volume does a person have. You know, what are your aspirations? How, what origination capacity do you have to generate? You know, deals reliably, right? And if it's not sufficiently high, you're probably better off to just continue to do them one at a time. Right. But if you people reach a certain point where they've built their infrastructure to handle a lot higher volume and then they run out of ability to raise money. Right. And that's when a lot of people start to say, well, I'm going to start thinking about a fund now because, right, I think I, I can do more volume if I had a fund, if the money was there. But then I'd say, well, then how are you going to raise the money once you set up the fund? Because it's not an if you build it, they will come thing. It's like you can build it, but then you got to go find them. And it's hard in the beginning, so it takes time. Yeah, and you, you mentioned that you know, okay, you don't you you're selling the same thing every time for your fund. However, I, I guess what what popped into my head there is that like, on the back end, now you have to make sure that the deals that you're going after are going to fit the criteria that you've put That's within right. that offering memorandum. So, you know, when, when we have a single deal, if I do, you know deal a and it's got you know return metrics of you know eight percent cash on cash and and a 16 percent irr just as an example and now if i put that but then you know the market shifts a little bit and now we're looking at it's probably going to be six percent and 13 percent well your fund is is probably already set up with the expectation that you're going to do deals that fit those initial criteria That's exactly right and so you probably i mean yeah it's the reality is it's hard it's a hard business but it's it's, it's uh right. however you do it you know you just gotta gotta find what fits for you and i think yeah you've because one question i've always had and if you have a fund what happens to the money that's just sitting there do you are you maybe this is something everybody knows but like what those investors you know if that's just sitting there you're waiting to get deal they're not necessarily getting uh, a return on that investment or, or how does that generally work it, yeah, it depends on the type of fund that you set up, but but generally speaking, on a closed-ended fund, you would take capital commitments, and then you would only draw down the capital as you need it to do those deals, right? So you're not paying out money or returns on money that's sitting there fallow, but you're and you're not requiring the investor to part with their cash to sit in a bank account that generates nothing. Right. So there's a variety of ways to handle that. And it depends on what kind of a fund you're doing. An open ended fund, you you just take the money and you deposit it. Uh, I mean, there's these are all the details that go into the drafting of these documents in an appropriate way. And a, a key part of it is to match the asset model, the timing, the frequency of the assets that you believe you're going to be acquiring with the structure of the fund and whether you're just taking the money directly in or whether you're setting up capital calls and so forth and so on. And just to maybe add to that sort of definition, when you say capital commitment, will you explain to people what that what that yeah, means so in reference I, to so a fund? 
So I'm your investor. You send me your documents. I say, all right, Jason, hey, I like what you're doing. I'm going to get, I'll, I'll invest a million bucks. And you say, great, but Matt, I don't really need your million just yet because I don't have all the deals tied up. Um, so I sign a capital commitment where I agree under certain contractual terms to provide you with my million dollars, right, over some time period. You know, and this is also an issue for investors too, because generally speaking, especially with high net worths, you know, and a million is probably high, right? Most people are investing 50 or 100 or 200 or some, yeah. you know, six figure, not seven figure number most of the time, right? And they don't want to wait around to give you the money over a year or two. They want to hand you, they want to give you your their money today and start earning a return on it. So it's kind of like you got to strike while the iron is hot. Otherwise, they're going to go somewhere else. So I'd say capital commitments are challenging for high net worth investors for a lot of reasons. So, you know, you may not, you may not want to structure it that way. I mean, yeah. this is a, at the end of the day, I'd say the funds are, they're not for everybody. They're, they're for a subset of people. I'd say syndications are more appropriate for probably 80 or 90% of managers and, and certainly for uh, allocators, but some subset of people reach enough scale where it makes a lot of sense to do it. And if you have the capacity to raise the money and you've got the deal flow, you know, a fund can be a much more um, streamlined and effective mechanism for the manager to to grow and scale, you know, a business. Yeah, yeah, that that makes <clears throat> makes a lot of sense. When you're so, if you're just talking capital raising in general, you mentioned before people, you know, you start with your your circle of influence, friends and family. A lot of people talk about, you know, the, the, a lot of people, it seems, start with a, you know. A 506B raise because mm -hmm. you know, it, it's, it's like it's nickname and just friends and family raising and that sort of thing. People, yep. people that you know and, and they don't necessarily have to be accredited. And then you might move from that to, you know, more of a 506C raise because now it seems you have a broader reach. But yep. at some point, you run out of friends and family, right? At some point, mm -hmm. you, you don't, you're, or maybe you don't run out of friends and family, but they run out of money to give you. And so then yep. as you're starting to scale up your capital raising, what do you, what do you suggest, you know, for someone who's been doing this for a long time and obviously very successful of it, what, how do you start to take those steps to get to the next level of level of capital raising beyond just, you know, kind of friends and family and, and maybe they're friends, but, but you start to reach that point where you're like, okay, now if I want to do bigger deals, I, I need to get in front of high net worth individuals. I need to get in front of family offices. Like I need to do yep the work to, to, you know, show those people that, that they uh, would be, it would be beneficial to them to invest with me. How, how do you suggest people work up that ladder? Yeah. And I, I think, you know, over 30 years, Jason, I've tried just about everything I could think of to, you know, help us raise money. I mean, going to conferences and, and it's changed a lot over the years, right? 20, 30 years ago, you, you couldn't advertise or solicit it. Everything right. had to be a fee. And, you know, as re uh, referrals was the single biggest, you know, source, if you could find a vein of people, right, like uh, certain uh, affinity groups and things like that always is helpful because, you know, people will move faster when they are recommended by somebody they trust, right? So I'd always try to find people that, that looked and sounded and smelled like the people I already, you know, worked with and then work outwards from there. Um, back in the older days, that's what I would do. And and I'd say the vast majority of our investors over the years have come from referrals of existing investors. And I'd make it a point, right, if they were happy to, to ask them about it. And fortunately, you know, we did a good job and they were happy and we were able to grow slowly over time and then more rapidly as as we got bigger. You know, I think today's world is very different, right? You got digital marketing now, you've got social media you know, you've got, you know, paid pay-per-click and banner ads. I mean, so it's a combination of a lot of different things. I think it's digital media. I think it's uh, PR. You know, if you can get educational-based articles placed in various things that get uh, people interested in it, that's super helpful. It develops your credibility. I think it's still the personal touch and the referrals, you know, and I think there's some value in going to a lot of these industry conferences that, 
Um, you, you generally don't meet that many investors at those things, but you definitely will find other ways of raising capital. So it, there's no magic formula. It's just a lot of different things that, you know, you got to do and you got to do it repeatedly and consistently to have any chance of success. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, and ultimately, I guess it really comes down to, well, most anything comes down to this, but, but putting in the work, uh, you know, doing, That's taking right. whatever steps it takes to, to get in front of more people and, and have those conversations and then developing yourself a track record. And I think obviously, you know, that, that seems to be observing people that are, you know, farther along in their career, that seems to be the thing. It's like, okay, they've, you know, once you've gone full cycle on a, on a number of deals, then it's, it, it seems to become uh, more and more, you know, the capital is a little more accessible, I suppose. Yeah. And I think, you know, for me in the early days, and we started off as a lender, right? I mean, we've done a lot of equity in the last 10 or 12 years, but in the first 15 or 20, I did mostly loans. And so we would match up individual um, uh, loans with individual investors and pay them an interest rate of, you know, 10 or 11%. We would keep a spread. We do all the work and, you know, you're paying interest every month or every quarter. And people are getting 10, 11, 12% interest and they're happy. They refer, hey, I've got a friend that has some money. And I'd say that was what really grew the business in the early days. So uh, referrals is yeah. the most powerful. And I mean, that's going to be your quickest way to get people to say yes, because they're transferring trust from somebody that, that you both already trust. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I do want to touch on, you know, sort of the current state of the market and, and, you know, maybe comparison to your experiences sure. around 2008, because again, I, not a lot of people, it, it seems like a lot of people, you know, not, didn't necessarily have to go through like we may have lived through 2008. I lived, I lived through 2008, but wasn't syndicating at that point. So yep. um, a lot of people have seen, you know, nothing but an upward market. So you saw that crash, the great recession um, and sort of had to rebuild from there. What do you, what do you feel like is going on now? I mean, what's your take? I understand, you know, nobody, nobody has a crystal ball. It's been, uh, I don't know nobody's going to hold you to it, but I'm honestly, sure. especially as someone that's been through, you know, the, the most recent downturn in the market, how do you feel this is, this is going to shake out? Yeah, I, I'm optimistic that it's not as fundamentally bad as the last one, right? I mean, credit quality deteriorated so heavily for, you know, 10 or 12, 15 years leading up to that one right? That there was just a lot of really bad assets and bad loans and things that took a long time for people to work their way out of. I don't think that's the case right now. I mean, the banks are very healthy, right? The delinquencies are very low. There's not a lot of fundamental problems with the, the asset quality. This is more of a capital markets issue where you're seeing interest rates going up at, at, a, at a pace that is unprecedented, yeah. right? So it's put a dramatic halt to um, to deal activity. And then of course you, between construction costs and labor costs, you know, prices have gone up so rapidly that it's just making deals, not pencil anywhere near the way they did, which is not to not unexpected, right? When you drop interest rates to near zero, it's going to drive up, you know, the value of these assets. So I view this as a more of a normal correction that needed to take place, not any less painful for certain people, right? Because if the deals don't work, and especially if you got into a deal that, you know, now all your assumptions are blown out of the water, right? Your cost assumptions are blown out of the water. Your interest rate assumptions are blown out of the water. It's like you looked at your financial model and your projections and now nothing matches anymore. Right. It's how do you make that deal work, especially if you're in the early stages of, of you know, execution of that business plan. Right. right. It's going to be hard and unless you're covered up on the backside by an increase in NOI and rent growth. Um, you know, deals are just not going to happen. So I, I think there's going to be a fair amount of pain this time around, but different type of pain than the last time around. Uh, I'm if I was a betting man, I'd say. You're probably looking at it capping out at another 125 basis points, 150, something like that. Maybe if we're lucky, that's next year. And I, I'm optimistic because there's still such a huge amount of money 
Alec, you know, sitting on the sidelines allocated toward real estate on these big institutional funds and other people who want to get into alts that um, I do think that you'll see the uh, return expectations, you know, be moderated even at a higher level of interest rate. So I think you'll see a lot of activity once you get out of this period of uncertainty where nobody knows how, how far and how fast it's going to go. That yeah, you know, that's my best guess. That said, Jason, I feel like with all of the uncertainty and the geopolitical, you know, world and war in Ukraine and you know the whole um, face off with China and and you know everything else that's happened, you know, and, and not to mention you know um, natural disasters that are causing unprecedented, you know, insurance claims and inability to get insurance in certain markets. I mean, there's just so many things that are happening that um, it's it's a little bit difficult to kind of get your mind around all of it. But but I, I think fundamentally, it's I don't think this is as as problematic as the last one, although it could turn into that if some of these other factors uh, coalesce to, to make it so. Right, right. Yeah, I, I think... I, I don't, I'm certainly not an expert, but I, I do feel like the biggest challenge we're facing right now in all of this is just the uncertainty part of it, right? Like, I agree. We, people keep thinking, I think, I feel like a lot of us were like, they can't keep doing this. Like, they can't keep raising the rate. <laughs> They're not going to go up this, you know, I've, I've listened to a lot of talks from a, a lot of people smarter than me that were like, no, this will, they'll stop this here and they'll, they'll start to level off and blah, blah, blah. And it just like, that's not happened yet. And so I think, yeah, I I, I think that once, once it does level off at whatever that is and people feel like it's stabilized, it, it's not so much that we have high interest rates, it's just that we don't know what's going to happen that makes Seems it scary right. to do deals. Yeah, and I mean, I, I use the analogy sometimes in our shop of, of, you know, the last 10 years has been like, for investors, this has been like driving a car down the freeway where it's, you know, 80 degrees and perfect outside, right? People can see 20 miles or 50 mile visibility and you're driving down a straight highway. And what do they do, man? They, they put on the gas and go, go as fast as you can. And that's what everybody was doing. And now all of a sudden, you know, the fog rolled in and, you know, it's the same highway and it's the same terrain, but all of a sudden you can't see more than a few hundred yards in front of your face. What do people do? Right. They slow way down. And that's exactly what's happening right now is people are just driving much, much slower. So they're still driving, but they're not going very fast and they're not taking a lot of risks. And that just makes it way harder to raise capital. And of course, sellers, you know, they got into their financial model right on whatever it looked like a month, a year or two years ago. Mm -hmm. And now, you know, their exit assumptions are blown out the window and they're not too keen if they don't have to to try to transact at the number that the buyer wants today given the fog they're driving in so deals just aren't happening yeah. i mean it's 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 fallen off a cliff in the last you know three four five months at least in our shop and pretty much everybody i talk to and that's a lot of people yeah. so you know i think until the fog starts to lift to your point uh people are going to drive pretty slow yeah, makes makes total sense. Um, Matt, let me switch gears uh, so I don't keep you all day, but I want to get to ask you the questions that I ask every guest. Um, the first one is is uh, you know of course based on the name of the show being know your why. Um, I like to ask everybody what what's your why? What what drives you um, you know towards continued success? You know, I think the biggest thing that's driven me in the last ten years, man, is like I, I've watched what's happened to investors and managers in this private space and. I know how hard it is and I know how easy it is to mislead people. And I know how e hard it is for an investor to find somebody they can trust. So, I mean, I think my why really is to help managers up their game and get better and be better and be worthy of the money that the investors give them and to help investors make better decisions, right? By just being more aware of what they're getting themselves into. So it's, it's, it's my, my, what drives both of our companies is trying to help both managers and investors in the private real estate space do a better job, scale their business, make better decisions and, and, you know, not get screwed. Um, yeah. 
So, you know, and a lot of that just flows out of like my own personal experiences, right? It's like, it, I know how hard it's been for me to do all this and we can make it easier for other people. You know, that that's what drives us. Yeah, it's fantastic uh, and, and needed. I, I do think that there's a, there, there is a, gap in you know sort of the the resources for especially passive investors to find out you know who should really be who sh who they can who they should trust um it, it's it, i think it's as someone who has has passively invested it, it is hard to kind of find that information so i think it's a it's a, a really good uh i don't know moderator between those two sides um having to do that um Second question for you, tell us something about yourself that uh, isn't common knowledge, special skill, a hobby, just, just something that you're comfortable sharing that maybe let, let listeners know you like. <clears throat> Excuse me, I'm a big road cyclist. So I uh, really like to ride a uh, road bike and uh, I've done seven cycle organs, which is uh, trips around, uh, organized rides around the state of Oregon to, um, uh support rural communities and all that so uh, i'd say that's probably my number one uh passion outside of work is is and, and family is you know riding my bike yeah cool um i'm i know i watch a lot have... i watch a lot of i watch a lot of cycling too so i was like okay. I, I subscribed to G, gcn which is global cycling network and you can watch pretty much every european uh uh you know world world tour uh road race and they're always on in the morning right because of the time difference so like i can wake up start go to work put it on my other screen and yeah you know why watch them watch them cycling i didn't even i didn't even know that existed so that's that's great i i have a, a couple of people i know that are like very big cyclists and i it i don't know it scares me i feel like the cars are the cars are much bigger being on the Yeah. the cars are always going to win that uh that interaction so um <laughs> yeah no i mean nothing's without its risk right yeah yeah absolutely um when people hear this and they want to reach out to you what's the best way uh you can reach me by email uh it's matt m-a-t-t -T, dot burke b-u-r-k no e on the end uh at fairwayamerica.com all right so we'll put uh, matt dot burke at fairwayamerica.com okay We'll put that in the show notes. Um, final question for you, Matt. What's what's a piece of advice that you would give to someone who is getting started as as an investor? And and given your perspective, you can, you know, as a passive investor or or an operator, you know, what what would you tell them uh, to to help them move forward? Well, I just gave a talk on uh, how to do better due diligence on on real estate managers at an event that we put on a couple of weeks ago. And and the number one thing I told investors is I focus on the manager first, right? Make sure you're dealing with a quality counterparty before you start getting too caught up in the details of the deal. Mm -hmm. I see a lot of investors get seduced by uh, fat IRR numbers right? Or rosy projections, but don't really pay any attention to how realistic they are or how, what credibility that manager has. So I'd start with the manager and focus on the manager first, then the deal, right? And then there's a whole bunch of other stuff after that, but I'd say it's the high level, you know, pick your, pick your jockey wisely. Yeah. Yeah. That's great. That's great advice. Um, well, thank you so much for coming on the show. I uh, really appreciate your time and your your insight. I think um, people will get a lot of value out of this and and kind of, again, I, I just think of a, a unique perspective um, in in the space that you're in and, and also just, you know, kind of what you've seen. So um, really, really interesting. And, and I do appreciate uh, you coming on. Yeah, my pleasure, man. And I uh, appreciate you having me and uh, feel free to reach out anytime. I'll be happy to, happy to try to help as best I can. Awesome. Awesome. And uh, for anyone listening, if you uh, enjoyed this episode, which I'm sure you will, please like, rate, and review. All right, we'll go ahead and sign out. I'd like to show you why knowing your why is the start of your journey. Without a strong why, it can be so difficult to reach your maximum potential. My name is Dr. Jason Ballara, and every week I meet with real estate investors and mindset specialists that are taking action in order to build a life according to their own terms. We will break down what drives successful people and allows them to achieve at such a high level. If you are a professional wanting to break through, or simply someone that wants to hear an inspiring story, the Know Your Why podcast is made for you.